Oh, nice to be here. It really is. Uh, I'm, I'm anxious. I'm anxious at several, several level, levels because I'm not a libertarian. I am a liberal and I do think that there is a distinction between the two. And I will be trying to unpack that. I'm anxious because I think my talk may be a little abstruse, not because you won't understand it, but because I don't understand what I'm talking about. But there is a distinction between the two. And I'm anxious because I'm going to do something that I don't think I've ever done before, which is substantially read a paper to you rather than speak to a paper. And I do that because I take this conference seriously. And I've spent several weeks actually uh, framing this paper. It's not that I want to thrust it down your throats, but I have tried carefully to think about the intersection between, um, between uh, libertarianism on the one hand and racism on the other. And of course that creates a polarity for us because libertarianism has as its underpinning the notion of freedom, whereas uh, racism or anti-racism has as its underpinning the notion of equality. So there is a fundamental clash um, between two sets of values since equality in order to be realized at least by typical conception is something that has to be dealt with coercively whereas freedom is something that we must respect as, a, as within the domain of autonomy. So we have a classic clash here and of course within this country it is a clash that is poignant for us all and that's why I'm anxious because I'm not sure that I have any satisfactory solutions uh, for uh, libertarians and I think I may have um, some awkward questions to pose. I have little doubt that you'll be able to answer them and I'll go away satisfied and I may be converted uh, to libertarianism, but I'm not at the moment. Um, so as I say in this talk, I consider whether our rules against racism and in favor of affirmative action, which are coercive in nature, can be reconciled with the principles of libertarianism. I think the exercise is useful because it sets up a challenge to libertarianism and seeks to explore its social utility. Of course, the same kind of exercise can be done in respect of other aspects in which we intervene, matters of gender or sexual orientation, for example. I leave them out of account, not because they are un unimportant, I think they're very important, but because the issue with which I engage is, really, is, is already demanding enough uh, to, keep, uh, to keep us uh, busy. Um, not being a libertarian, you might ask me, what qualifies me to speak to you today? And I think the answer is, bar my research is very little, except that I can look at the other aspect because I've done an enormous amount of work over the years in litigation before the Constitutional Court in a number of cases on the question of equality, what it means, what our, what our law is doing so far as equality is concerned, how our Constitution has been perverted by the Constitutional Court and beaten, panel beaten into a set of, uh, uh, into an ideological set that moves us from non-racialism on the one hand to multiracialism on the other, which is what the Constitutional Court now espouses. And if you want, want a, um, a, a consideration of the distinction between the two, non-racialism is concerned with promoting the notion that everybody, uh, the Martin Luther King notion that everybody is, uh, is, a, is a person in, in his or her own right and is not to be characterized uh, by the color of their skin. Um, and multiracialism is, is in indeed absolutely the converse, which is the notion that we should stream people by race and give them um, demographic uh, representation at every level of our society. It's a completely different concept. And the, as I say, the Constitutional Court, despite the injunctions of the Constitution, has moved from the one, that is the principle of non-racialism, which is embodied in the Constitution, uh, to the principle of multiracialism, which is embodied in the Constitutional Court judgments. And we are embarked upon a process of uh, re- uh, reinventing apartheid because apartheid itself was of course multiracial. It was it's streamed by race. The system was streamed by race. Um, I find libertarianism fascinating though because it presents the outer extremity uh, for me 
of my liberal values and it allows me through the prism of, it, of libertarianism to challenge my liberal values and find out what, where, they, where they are and where they are not. Now the legal practice, uh, I want to give you an example, the Legal Practice Act uh, has been introduced which uh, deprives uh, lawyers of autonomy over their own, uh, the regulation of their own affairs and vests the power of regulation in the state. There are some good reasons for doing that and others that are not. And there is a council that has been created and the council comprises 10 elected people and a number of appointees. And the question of how the election should be uh, made has been one that has, uh, has found um, its characteristic uh, echo in the, in, the, in the legislation which says that there must be due regard paid uh, to the demographic, demographic plurality of the country. And what the, uh, how this was translated in practice was this, that there shall be a specific number of black men, a specific number of black women, a specific number of white men, and a specific number of white women. And people are asked when they stand for candidacy uh, to, um, to stipulate um, what they are. Some people put what race they are. Some people put down black, some people put down white, some people put down Indian, some people put down colored, some people put down human, member of the human race. It all appeared on the ballot. And the voting duly took place and there was the question of the appointment of these various people within the racial demographics and that's what the Legal Practice Council has at the moment. And there's been an outcry amongst uh, liberal practitioners such as myself as to whether this is an appropriate way to proceed. And the, um, everybody says it's outrageous that we should be reverting to apartheid, uh, apartheid norms and so on and so forth. How could we possibly do that? Of course, the establishment uh, then comes back with the usual, uh, the usual um, um, justifications, all of which I'm not going to go, go into now. And then the question occurred to me, well, if the, if the council was purely by appointment, in other words, not by election, and the appointees had all been white, would there have been a national outcry in the country? And the answer is by, by all means, yes. And if the appointees had all been black African, would there have been a national outcry in the country? And the answer perhaps is yes. If the, if the appointees had all been men, and there'd been an, uh, there would there have been an outcry? Yes. If they'd all been women, well, I suppose there would have been an outcry too. And then I started thinking, well, where am I? Where am I as a liberal when I think that we can discount these distinctions and look for the Martin Luther King moment where everybody is a human being? I said, well, I keep thinking, where am I? And I haven't solved that problem. But at least I think as a liberal about those questions. And you, of course, as libertarians, will think about them too. But what's lovely about a libertarian conference, what's lovely about my capacity to participate in it, is that a libertarian conference gives me the, gives me the opportunity to test the outer lim limits of what I understand is the appropriate way in which raci racism should be regulated. So where am I? I'm here telling you about my um, race-based past, but I'm not uh, a libertarian either by devotion or indeed by analysis. But I have looked hard at what libertarianism entails and I've listened very carefully uh, to the debates that have been mounted this morning on that question and I recognize that there is a history in this organization that goes back a long time of which I must be thoroughly respectful in the quest for what libertarian means. And I am a libertarian sympathizer. I'm a libertarian fellow traveler, so I really am genuinely respectful about it. What I take to be um, libertarianism is that it considers the individual to be inviolate, to be sacrosanct, if you like. The individual is the organizing moment for libertarianism. Um, libertarians believe that the individual's interests should yield to none, whether they be other individuals, a king or a dictator or the like, or other bodies such as governments, officials and regulators. When Margaret Thatcher said that there is no such thing as society, everybody laughed at her in Britain, or rather they condemned her, um, which is not quite the same thing. But what she said is there's no such thing as society, there are only individual men and women, and that captures the notion, though I don't think Thatcher by any means was a libertarian, 
but it captures the notion that the individual, autonomous and self-actualizing, is the organizing moment and the only organizing moment of political and social life. And that's very, very important, and it's something with which I identify and identify acutely. And somebody has pointed out already, but I think it needs to be said again, that libertarians, if consistent, concede the same rights of individual integrity and autonomy to others as they individually demand for themselves. I, and Leon made the point that an individual can be an individualist and yet not be a, a libertarian, because an individual to be a libertarian um, must the dem demand the, right, the same rights for others in respect to personal autonomy as the libertarian demands, as that in libertarian individual demands for uh, himself or herself. Um, the libertarian is often depicted as selfish or egocentric, but in fact the very opposite is true. Libertarians concede the same freedom to others as they demand for themselves. So, um, and it seems to me that libertarians, and here I think I, I, I differ uh, from Colin, it's Colin, isn't it? Colin? Yes, For, forgive me. Libertarians, I don't think libertarianism is a tendency. I think it is a political ph philosophy, and it's a political ph philosophy with tenets that deserve respect. Um, it, is a, it, is, it is a fundamental principle by which people should live and interrelate. I don't share Colin's views about the notion that it's a mere tendency, and I don't share his views on the notion of that creative destruction of the sort that he describes as implicit in the market, which is what Hayek and people have talked about, is uh, antithetical to, uh, is antithetical to uh, libertarianism. Um, but Murray Rothbard, Murray Rothbard, of whom many of you will be familiar, is, is uh, sympathetic to what you say. He says libertarianism is not and does not pretend to be a complete moral or aesthetic theory. He says that libertarianism is a ph philosophy seeking a policy. And what he's trying to do is convey the notion, which is exactly the one so helpfully conveyed, Colin, by you, that libertarian is, libertarianism is a kind of zeitgeist. It's a kind of spirit that moves us. We move um, through, uh, from, libertarian, from a liber libertarian impulse into a libertarian ideology or a libertarian philosophy. But it is a philosophy nonetheless, it seems to me. And it has to be, it's a philosophy that requires to be, it must be taken seriously. It's a philosophy, it's important to understand that is normative. It is not consequentialist. In technical terms, it's said to be, de de well, it doesn't matter. Um, but what it isn't is, it, it, it's, it's normative in the sense that it is a belief system, it's a value system. It's not utilitarian. It is not a question of weighing up the social utility of one standpoint against another, one policy against another, or one attitude against another, one intervention against another. Libertarians don't do that. Liberals do. And that's why I make that distinction. There is a fundamental distinction between the utilitarian or the uh, analogous utilitarian approach that liberals take uh, to matters of government policy which says we have to weigh up the benefits, for instance, of affirmative action against the detriments of it, and, an, and, a, and a principle that says, I will not take into account uh, those notions, but I believe that, I believe in a philosophy that everybody should be free um, to, uh, to, to generate uh, their own, um, their own uh, outcomes, free to generate their own uh, um, solutions. Um, so when we start saying, as uh, Richard Epstein, who has written famously within this area, as in so many other areas in the United States, in an effort to uh, uh, promote the notion of initially of uh, libertarianism and ultimately of utilitarianism, um, Richard Epstein says things like, uh, blacks would be better off were there no affirmative action what he's adopting is a utilitarian uh, um, postulate. He's not adopting a libertarian uh, postulate. And he himself recognizes that because what he says is over the 20 years of his writing, he has painfully moved 
from a libertarian position to a utilitarian position um, in order uh, to justify the stances that he takes on questions of, uh, uh, in opposition to intervention um, 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 at the level of anti-racism and affirmative action within the United States. Um, so he says he has been engaged in a slow transformation from a natural rights libertarian to a limited government utilitarian, uh, utilitarian over 20 years or so. And he says, perhaps I can pick this up, he says his basic framework is not libertarian now because he does not treat individual autonomy and mutual exchange as the bedrock values of a system of legal rights. Now, the next point I want to make is a, is a libertarian is not anarchic. If by anarchy we mean the absence of rules, of uh, governing rules. Uh, in utopia, no doubt, everyone would accept and respect the integrity of everyone else without being forced to do so. But libertarians are willing to make the compromise that says that we recognize that not everybody is libertarian and that not everybody will accord the same respect to others as they insist on, uh, on for themselves and that all libertarians are not always consistently uh, libertarian. So they recognize the notion that there should be rules against the exercise of coercion or the exercise of force. In order to promote liberty, people must be forced uh, not to invade upon or entrench upon uh, liberty. And where you move from there, of course, um, you move from there to the notion that if I want to protect myself against force as an effective libertarian, then what I can do is either use my own fists or I can hire fists uh, for the purposes of that protection, security guards and the like. And ultimately, as Nozick uh, uh, um, points out, one has to move to the point where it is fundamentally wrong only to postulate uh, that there should be um, self-reliance on the question of self-protection, you must move to the notion that the state must provide that self-protection. Nozick then comes down to the notion that there should be a night watchman state, and he says, the first transition from a system of private protective agencies to an ultra-minimal ultra minimal state will occur by an, an invisible hand process in a morally permissible way that violates no one's rights. Secondly, we argue that the transition from an ultra-minimal state to a minimal state morally must occur. He says, it would be morally impermissible for persons to maintain the monopoly in the ultra-minimal state without providing protective services for all, even if this requires specific redistribution. The operators of the ultra-minimal state are morally obliged to produce the minimal state. So he moves from the conception of personal self-protection by my own fists to protection uh, through the mechanisms of hired fists to ultimately to the protection that the, that the state must provide. And it's because there are old people, there are weak people, there are poor people and so on who cannot provide that self-protection for themselves. So morally, there must be a transition uh, from self-protection um, at one's own behest to protection through the state. Um, so what, what do we end? We end up with something that goes like this, that libertarians are within uh, this domain, that humans are sovereign over their mind and body, meaning you own yourself. From this flows the necessary corollary of property rights, meaning individuals have a valid claim to the byproducts of their minds and bodies. Axiomatically, we know that humans have, the, have, the, have to act to survive. And from self-ownership and property rights, we arrive at a theory of when force is permissible, namely in self-defense. And these ideas, ought, these ideas of self-ownership, property rights, and non-aggression ought to apply to everyone, even when a group bands together and calls themselves government. When governments use force, this is the liber, li, libertarian uh, postulate, the Nozick libertarian postulate, when governments use force or threaten force in ways that are not definable as self-defense, their acts are invalid. Finally, we recognize that libertarians are not anarchic because they recognize the potential for the creation of rules by contract, by interaction. 
I can agree with you that I will refrain from doing X, Y, and Z, or help you do A, B, and C. So libertarians, far from being asocial or antisocial or extrasocial, libertarians are intensely social because they create the societies or anticipate that they create the societies uh, for themselves, and they do so by contract. And ultimately, of course, then we have the contractarian theories of how the state comes about, that we are all, if we don't do it explicitly, that we all implicitly submit ourselves uh, to the state, ha ha, that we submit ourselves to the state contractually in order to allow the state um, to work uh, for the common good of all. And that is, a, that is the social contract notion. Uh, Proudhon had it, um, Rousseau had it, and even, uh, and even as late, late as the 1970s, it was, a, it was the underpinnings of John Rawls' theory of how states are constructed. But the libertarians see this, this notion of the social contract, as the thin end of a very thick wedge, and they reject that notion. They reject the notion that the social contract can be press-ganged into force in order to justify uh, the construct of the state with its coercive powers. They say that so far and no further. Um, so I identify, frankly, with the following, which I take to be an ideological position, that libertarians maintain that people should be free from their individual societal or government interference to live life any way they desire, pursue happiness, accumulate wealth, assess risk, make choices, engage in commerce with anyone who is willing, participate in any economic activity for profit, and spend the fruits of their labor as they see fit, as long as their actions are peaceful, their associations are voluntary, their interactions are consensual, and they don't violate the personal or property rights of others. Hallelujah! <laughs> and where do we get with racism? Racism, of course, there are many definitions of racism as there are people who write and think about it. Um, you can define racism by, by, by reference to the intent that underpins a particular act, or you can de define racism by reference to the consequences of the act. If the, in the United States, they've done both. They started out with a statute uh, that used motive or intent as its, um, um, as its uh, um, moving force. And they, they went from there uh, to disparate impact, which is the impact that policies have. So they end up and come into an organization, come into a, a co company, and they say, how many whites do you have? How many men do you have? How many blacks do you have? Uh, how many black men do you have? And are, is there a proper, proper distribution? Disparate impact. It doesn't matter for present purposes. That's how they operate. Um, there, there seem to be two forms of uh, racism. The one is malign, or I call it malign. There are better words, I have little doubt, to express it, which is uh, the malign variant, typically conceived, as typically conceived as classic racism, believes that blacks are inferior for genetic or behavioral reasons. They have lesser IQs and so lesser intelligence on the one hand, or they are culturally deprived in some way and thus become, in some, some sense, socially debased. The benign source, which, sort which we can call racialism, believes that blacks perform less well because, as a group, they have been subject to past discrimination. So we have the polarity. Blacks are inferior, or blacks have been treated as inferior in the past, and therefore we must have redress. Both lead potentially to the same place, because anybody who, who believes as a, as, a, as a social agent, as opposed to an individuated agent, but anybody who believes as a social agent uh, that, people, that, a, that a group of people defined as such within a, within, a, within a society can simply be neglected, even though they are less competent, capable or competent of performing, such as, for instance, handicapped people, anybody believes that they can simply be uh, treated as nevishes or nothings, is actually has serious challenges to confront uh, from the other people in society. Of course, the question of whether we should ever engage upon the debate about whether blacks are infer intellectually inferior, less competent, and so on, um, or, or uh, deserve to be at the leg up on the other ground that they have been <laughs> discriminated in the past, that people who engage upon that can sort of consideration are uh, simply producing controversy for the sake of controversy 
and should be not allowed, not actually allowed to speak. And I'm conscious uh, of uh, uh, Peterson himself, who declines to enter into the debate about whether black IQs, whether the consequence of the fact that there's a gap between black and white IQ in the United States, which is replicated in this country, is instructive in any way about the capacity of blacks to perform effectively. He says he won't go there because it's too controversial. And that underpins the notion that we shouldn't engage upon these kinds of topics, and perhaps we shouldn't, except that the whole conception of how we think about these matters, a, a program such as Head Start in the States, which is designed to give uh, black children um, a leg up into society, there you are, I told you. Um, the, the notion of that, the notion of whether we should do those things on one premise or another depends upon a proper analysis of precisely these considerations. Now we have rules against racism in this country. You don't have to be told about that. You've been told about Penny Sparrow already and you can see, for instance, what that means. Those rules are coercive. We can't deny that. They're coercive both at the level of prohibiting racial utterances, prohibiting uh, race-based decisions uh, again, that make, uh, uh, that, well, decisions that, make, uh, that are made on the basis of, of race. And also we have uh, coercive provisions governing affirmative action. And those provisions all have an impact. Now libertarians have a most profoundly difficult way to reconcile their ideology with those, those particular interventions. Should they happen at all? The libertarians' answer must, it seems, subject to what I'm going to say in a moment, must be no. There should not be those sorts of interventions. We should not prohibit people from being uh, racist. We should not uh, require people uh, to employ people on the basis of the color of their skin. We should allow those matters to, to repose within the voluntary domain. There are libertarians, conscientious libertarians, who try to get round this conundrum, and it is a conundrum for libertarians. Not for liberals, mind, because liberals are utilitarians, but it is for, for uh, libertarians. Um, and the, the conundrum is, is, they escape the conundrum by saying, oh, one of two things. One, they say, well, we have, as libertarians, a doctrine uh, of non-aggression, no force. Utterances that are racist uh, or conduct that is racist um, is ultimately um, aggressive. And therefore, we can tuck in under our rubric, the exception that we've created, we can tuck in the notion that there should be uh, um, prohibitions on racist statements, racist conduct and the like. Um, so, for instance, somebody says, a man called Richmond says this. He says, um, he's, well, after, uh, let me just summarize for a moment. He, say, he says, if all men and women are or should be equal in authority, and if none may be subordinate another against, and if none may subordinate another, subordinate another against his or her will, a libertarian would naturally object to even nonviolent forms of subordination and racism. And, and he says uh, that that is what a libertarian can do. In other words, you use the, the exception of non-aggression in order to justify the intervention against racism and the intervention indeed in favor of affirmative action. And this is considered a, what is called a thick form of libertarianism. Um, but it doesn't, by thick is meant uh, impregnated by substance. But it doesn't really work, it seems to me, because if we are saying that ultimately there should be no subordination one to the other in a suitably regulated libertarian state, then we must recognize all the other things that conduce towards subordination, such as poverty. And once we do that, we are immediately into the domain of redistributive uh, uh, measures, such as social welfare and so on, which are fundamentally repellent uh, to libertarian conceptions of right and wrong. So it's a problem. Um, so we know that nothing forces us as libertarians or liberals, nothing forces us to take the stances that we do. We take them because we think they are appropriate. 
We libertarians, such as yourselves, sustain their position on the basis, in fact, those 50% that are libertarians, the other 50% are authoritarians, so you can actually forget about all the things. <laughs> but libertarians sustain their position on the basis that they are sturdily individualist and entitled to be so. They self-identify with libertarianism and do so because they think it is right. Now, people have done, um, psychologists have done a lot of work on what makes up the libertarian mindset, and I thought I'd share some of it with you. It's a bit collateral to my talk, but never mind. Firstly, there is a strong, strong endorsement of individual liberty as the foremost guiding principle um, and a weaker endorsement of other moral principles. Secondly, there is a relatively cerebral as opposed to emotional cognitive style. Interesting. And thirdly, there is a lower interdependence, interdependence and social relatedness. Instructively, libertarians are said to be less likely to be responsive uh, to moral appeals from groups who claim to be victimized, uh, oppressed or treated unfairly. Uh, beyond question, I think we must accept that the libertarian position is a very conservative one. It must be, axiomatically it must be so. It postulates that nothing should be done coercively, coercively to redress social disparities, even those regarded as unfair, and instead individuals should be left to shift as best they can. The libertarian position is non-interventionist to the core. Liberals and the like may suggest that blacks should at least arguably be, be protected from racism and given preference by way of affirmative action. This argument is certainly tenable if blacks are in an inferior position because of past discrimination. It is also tenable, I venture to suggest, even if their position, even if the position is, their inferior position is a product of innate incompetence and perhaps lack of conscientiousness. Since they make, they make the same kind of claims as people based, same sort of claims as people based um, who, who suffer handicaps. Um, on the, but liberals say, well, no, no, but we must weigh up the measures and ask ourselves to what extent they are genuinely efficacious in society. But the, for the libertarian, there is no such recourse unless you use the exceptions that I've just referred to, because the libertarian is principled, not consequentialist. The libertarian is no, position is normative, not consequentialist. Um, The, there, there's something called social dominance theory that, then, that is then brought to bear and it's not a kind of theory uh, that, is, that proceeds from a libertarian frame of mind. It postulates that dominant groups will use ide ideological instruments such as notions of natural rights, national superiority, superiority national destiny, um, racism, Protestant work ethic, etc., and political ideology in an effort to legitimize their claims over resources. These ideologies, ideologies, it is said, are often couched in terms of the work ethic, positive social benefits of individual selfishness, and the beneficial workings of the free market. Within social dominance theory, then, the basic desire for group-based anti-egalitarianism and in-group dominance is posited to be the primary motivating force behind political conservatism, racism, and a large array of other social attitudes and ideologies. Um, the, how, do, how do we get to the notion that a libertarian is a racist? Why, the answer to that is this, that you become a racist if you adopt an ideology that forecloses on your capacity um, to regulate uh, matters of racism and regulation matters of past disadvantage um, um, by, by law. That your adoption, the, the very adoption, your very identification with a libertarian mindset is an identification designed, albeit subconsciously, but designed to promote uh, your own status as a, uh, within the dominant echelons of society. There are ways in which libert uh, libertarians can get around this. Um, the libertarians can say, uh, that the atti these attitudes, these attitudes that we adopt are collateral, uh, the consequence of these attitudes are, are collateral to the fundamental principle we espouse, that is the fundamental principle that everybody must be, must be given the maximum amount of freedom. But the very process of adopting 
libertarianism as opposed to, say, liberalism. And I'm not championing liberalism here. But the very process of adopting a libertarian postulate uh, by foreclosing on the consideration of utilitarian conceptions of what is better or worse for society uh, in terms of combating racism is itself um, opens the libertarian up to condemnations of being racist himself or herself. Thank you very much. Um, there are um, rotten eggs at the back for those people who wish to throw. Yeah. This, uh, I agree with more of what you say than a hardcore purist libertarian like me might be expected to do. Uh, and I think that there's some great confusion amongst many libertarians about such questions as to the degree of utilitarianism that might occur, uh, or the degree to which it's an absolute principle. Uh, I, I would like to meet the libertarian who would rather starve to death than uh, pick up you know, some potatoes from a neighboring large potato farm and violate someone's potato rights. Yes. Um, uh, no, you wouldn't. You would obviously then say, uh, I, I value my life more than that person's property rights, and so on. Um, the, uh, the, the other one is that uh, I would like to see the libertarian who, when their friend is motherless, drunk, and about to get in a car and drive away, who wouldn't take away the keys or, you know, call an Uber or drive them themselves or whatever, and would let their friend, uh, you know, drive at great risk, or, for that matter, commit suicide because they temporarily stunned or drunk or whatever, you probably coercively interfere, and then hope the next day your friend says thank you. Uh, so I think these things do not have the, the absolute purity that anyone uh, imagines they do, and I agree with you that they But what I probably disagree with you on is that there is such a clear-cut division. Uh, I think uh, liberalism and libertarianism, for me, I picture them more as a matter of degree um, and, and less as a matter of principle, because I think in each, the principles are not absolute and uh, the, the boundaries are fuzzy and, uh, and I would uh, say that. Now I do want to also say about the word libertarianism which has cropped up here. Uh, I was criticized for not saying on television or radio or anywhere else that I'm a libertarian. I don't even say I'm for freedom or liberty. Uh, very rare that I say that and the reason is quite simple. I don't think many people care a damn about freedom, is my view. They want a utilitarian argument. They want to know why is Leon low against the anti-tobacco laws? And I advance practical arguments that they can't be enforced in high density areas, uh, that they uh, lead to health hazards because people can't deal with psychological problems like depression and so on. So I advance simply because my judgment is that the world out there works on pragmatic utilitarian uh, requirements. So that's what I present. Uh, I think I'll be wasting my breath and my time if I get up on TV or radio or write a newspaper column in which I say the reason I'm against uh, town planning laws is because they violate the liberty of people living in shacks. Uh, if people will just think I'm, I've lost it. If on the other hand I say it prevents people living in shacks from upgrading their own living standards, I think someone's likely to listen and say, well, that's interesting. You know, so so I, I, uh, I want to make the case for utilitarianism and, pra and pragmatism, even though that's not what drives me personally. Personally, I just like liberty. I don't know why, it's in my genes, it's just my impulse, it's like columns, so I just, I, I can't drive by the police violating a little old lady sitting on the side of the road selling boiled millies. Uh, it just offends me uh, because her liberty is being violated. That's the impulse. If I go on TV and say that, people won't listen. I have to go and advance practical, pragmatic, boring, mundane arguments. Those are the ones I think work. What's interesting, I think, just to pick up on that, we talked about liberty, and I thought the, your talk was fascinating in relation to this because it's, Leon makes an echo to it. 
we see in the United States that there is a libertarian party. And it actually in draws, I think, about 2% of the vote, Leon? 6%. Is it as high as that now? I didn't think it had got that high. I think it peaked at the one point, but it's more like 1 or 2%. And, and you think, well, hey, that's great. Um, and I was thinking to myself, if I was an American, I would vote for that party. I wouldn't vote for the other two. Um, however much I adore Trump and I love Hillary Clinton, I wouldn't vote for that other bunch. Uh, what was his name? Johnson, was it? What is his name? No, the, the latest. Uh, Gary, 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 Johnson. Gary Johnson. Yeah, I'd vote for him. Um, but of course, it's not a libertarian party at all. It's a liberal party. It is actually a liberal party. And what, is, what the writing all, all stresses is, is that libertarianism is a word that has been, has been colonized by the liberals um, in the States in order to create the distinction, and astutely colonized in order to create the distinction um, between the American conception of liberalism, which is socialism or social democrat uh, uh, pol policy, and, uh, and liberalism properly so called. Yeah. Paul Johnson, uh, by the way, got, I mean, um, Gary Johnson got 3.3%. 3 oh, I think that's amazing. Really, no. yes. And they, they must have been talking about libertarianism a little bit. <laughs> I'd like to take the opposite position to Leon. I would like to think of myself as uh, a principled libertarian who would adhere to the fundamental principles, the non aggression principle, and, and others. Um, I don't know what the word would be, uh, stoically perhaps. The point for me is that um, you have to have principles, and if they are amendable and easily changeable, then what is the point of holding them? So, for example, if there's a libertarian friend dying of hunger on the side of the road, um, would I invade a, a private property to, to save him? The answer is, is always, of course I would, but it must always be a wrong act. And I must always be accountable for that act before some greater jury. And the point there would be is that it would be an understandable act and easily forgivable, uh, but it would never not be a wrong act. And for me, the critical issue here is the consistency of the law rule the, the, the philosophy that you adopt. So for example, if we lived in a libertarian society that consisted of this room, Sichler and other blacks would have a real hard job getting, a, getting employed. Okay, they would be one in 50 and that would be the ratio um, if we were to implement a, a racist uh, distribution. Mm -hmm. If we were to implement a racist distribution across the world, well, at least one third of us should be Muslims, um, at least one quarter of us should be Chinese. Um, it, it's just incons inconsistent and crazy. It only becomes slightly consistent in the South African context because we're used to it. So for me, that is the, you have a principle, the libertarians, I think, have quite good principles, and you stick to those because if you endlessly amend them in favor of utilitarianism, utilitarian interests will endlessly be inconsistent. Would you invade your neighbor's house in order to get food for the person, your friend that is dying on the side of the road? A graphic example. And you say that is an excusable form of wrong or a wrong for which you might... I don't say it. I say it's an inexcusable form of wrong. In other words, you must be accountable for it. But then are you not effectively adopting, in relation to that, a utilitarian calculus that says it is better to commit the, what you characterize to be a wrong, uh, I wouldn't, but what you characterize to be a wrong, in order to promote the better good? It must always be a wrong act in terms of a consistent philosophy. The fact that you will not be punished for it by any of your peers, the fact that people will give you medals for, for doing that, is a corollary. It must always remain a wrong act for your society to have any sense of order. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just make to raise two comments briefly. Um, one is you, you said libertarianism is fundamentally conservative. Yeah. And 
I'm not sure that I can agree with that. Um, conservatism tends to be very authoritarian. Right? It says let's, let's impose laws and constraints that prevent society from changing uh, in ways that we are uncomfortable with. Because, you know, we are comfortable with the way we've always done it, we are comfortable with our religion or whatever. And it's an authoritarian position. Whereas libertarianism leaves everyone free to do whatever they like. And in fact, that freedom in the last several years since the Enlightenment has produced an immense amount of progress. Um, I would actually characterize libertarians, libertarianism as more fundamentally progressive um, because it permits progress. Not, are we, are we, not that it actively seeks progress, but it, it permits progress. Are we, is the problem between us one of semantics? Because by conservatism, I mean that you conserve the current position in the sense that you don't intervene. And what is striking about libertarianism for me is that it's ahistorical and asocial. Yes. In other words, it doesn't take, take account of how we got here. It's largely ahistorical. Yes. And, and it doesn't take account of what others think and feel. Now that, that brings me to the second point. You said libertarianism forecloses on utilitarian policies of redress. Uh, for past racial injustice, for example. It doesn't entirely. Um, it looks at things slightly differently. If, for example, there's past uh, injustice in terms of uh, deprivation of property rights, uh, there's nothing in libertarian philosophy that says you cannot find redress for the fact that your property rights were violated uh, under a previous regime on a racist basis. Right? So if you can actually claim that, yes, the land was stolen, Right. It's absolutely legitimate to start a, a judicial process and say, well, then the land needs to be accepted. Because that's, that, that's consistent with the notion that if you have a non-aggression aggression rule, then there must be remedies for that yes, by way of uh, redistribution. Right. That, that, that must be redressed. And perhaps I haven't stated that. In the other, in the other sense that there's redress um, is, uh, you know, the materials seek equality before the law. Right. Now, if there was past inequality before the law, right, then the redress that a libertarian would propose is to now have equality before the law. Right. Whereas some more other utilitarian philosophies might say, well, now you need negative discrimination in order to seek redress for past discrimination. Uh, discrimination in the other direction. That a libertarian would not accept. No, I don't think so. Sorry. Although that, that fellow that I quoted um, Sheldon thought you could, that this was an appropriate way to proceed. I don't think yes. it's. I don't think it's consistent with libertarianism. No, it's not consistent with libertarianism. libertarianism says don't discriminate, right? and in particular, the state shouldn't discriminate. Um, you know, the law shouldn't discriminate. Uh, and once that state has been achieved of non-discrimination, right, then that is that is the that is the successful input. Of, of course, what what distinguishes the state as an aggregate of uh, of social power from the individual who aggregates social power in, um, like a warlord is only a matter of degree, I take it. No, I'm not, no, I'm, I, I, make, I, make a, I make a big distinction between what, say, companies do and what the state does, or what individuals do and what the state does. The state has power that no individuals have, but no companies have. Then, then we're on the same page. And that is a power that the state needs to use in certain ways, it needs to be limited from using in certain ways. And one of those important limitations is not to discriminate. Yeah. Um. Can I ask, is the common law a consequentialist um, or utilitarian uh, thing, or is it a moral thing? It moves from, a, it moves from an essentially liberal postulate, um, but has strong consequentialist overturns. And I, I know that sounds... But liberals, liberals as I've tried to stress, um, have... Uh, uh, have plenty of space for utilitarian uh, arguments which are consequential in their nature. So the common law certainly does, for instance. Um, the common law is, regards itself as, uh, as f fairness writ large. Fairness. Fairness writ large. What is, what is fair as between one human being and another. And so it strikes, it, it, it walks, it favors liberty as a, as a um, residual postulate, as a, as a fundamental postulate but has the notion that there should be palliatives for that. So we don't, for instance, enforce agreements in restraint of trade, even though they're consensually produced in circumstances where they're considered to be oppressive. So there is intervention. And there are, other, there are, also, there are a dozen other situations like that.
common law or certain books of consequences. All the, time. All the time. And judges Policy do. Consequences. Judges do. I mean, Rex is a judge, he knows that. Rex, why don't you float out your idea of, uh, of the libertarian uh, um, conception as one that is aspirational, and I'm putting words in your mouth, which I shouldn't, is aspirational rather than... <coughs> it's an issue um, that Martin and I discussed at some length during the course of last evening and this morning on the way. <coughs> but what, what I perceive to be the difficulty with, with Martin's approach is that the libertarian is not so much concerned with, with the society as it is. In many ways, the libertarians come to their libertarian view because they have an innate hostility to the way in which society is structured. Society is, is structured in, in a way that, that favors what I call the democratic bribe. And the democratic bribe is, is well recognized throughout the world. It's, it's a process whereby eventually the freedom of the individual is whittled down in favor of a collective interest or perceived interest. And because the collective is always numerically stronger and, and therefore politically more powerful by way of the voting booth, um, they are a cons consequently uh, an attractive group for any political aspirant. And so the, the Labour Party is going on that, the Socialist Party, and so on and so forth. And Joseph Schumpeter had a very interesting thesis about this. In his seminal work on capitalism, socialism, and democracy, uh, he postulated, and he wrote, I think, the book in just shortly after the Second World War, that uh, inevitably democracy would, would gravitate towards socialism. And the reason why that is an inevitability is because of the selfishness, the selfish gene within, within the, the, the politicians on the one hand who are looking after their own interest in seeking the, the maximum advantage for themselves at the polling group. And a similar and corresponding selfish gene within that large pool of, of the disempowered, perceived to be disempowered electorate, which can easily be appealed to by socialist and communist and other such populist causes. And we see that in Operation South Africa. Now this is just a long way of introducing the background to my thinking. That is that certainly one of the ways in which I came to my libertarian philosophy was that I looked about me and what I saw was things that displeased me. And they displeased me to such an extent that I thought to myself, well, how? within the structure of the society, the way in which it works then as an apartheid system, now as a, as a supposedly democratic system, which is really not much better for, for a variety of different reasons. How, how, how do you position yourself? And, and eventually you come to, to, to a philosophical answer. Now let me give a practical example. Suppose that one was uh, an Argentinian of similar age to most of the people around here, most of the elderly people and, and one had grown up in a society where there was a recollection of the glory days of the Argentinian economy, just between the two world wars, when Argentine was one of the most powerful economic states in the world, one of the four or five most significant economic states in the world. And along came Peron, who, who created for himself and for his dynasty a, um, a dynastic kind of empire, a political dynasty, a dynasty, a dynasty, a dynasty. And the result of this is what we know to be the Argentinian chaos of today. Mm. And what a couple of governments have attempted to do during the course of the last 20 or 30 years is to move away from Peronism into, into a more free market oriented type of society. But each of those attempts, and there's one underway right at the moment in Argentina um, by, by the President Macri, who was elected, I think, two or three years ago, on a free market platform. But they find that the implementation of their policy in the light of this vested interests that have been created over the course of decades is an unwinnable 
because, because they're confronted by a reluctant and very often a very hostile electorate. Uh, the result of this is that their attempts at financial reform <coughs> and monetary reform, at recreating the value of the Argentine peso, all of this is thwarted not only by the local populace and uh, by its, its, its populist international, but also by the international community who view the country with grave suspicion. And in viewing the country with grave suspicion, the interest rates on borrowed money is always much higher than, than other, other contemporary countries, other equivalent countries, and so on. So they feel themselves at a disadvantage, they feel themselves unable to bring about the policies that, that they seek to do. Now, where do I position the libertarian role for this? I say, well, if, if I were an Argentine citizen, and I've grown up with the recollection of the glory days of, of, of the Argentine economy, when, when there was a great deal of prosperity, and when Buenos Aires was regarded as the, as the Paris of, uh, of, of the West, and, and I had seen the destruction that had been wrought by Peron, Evita, and, and that whole cult that was, that was built around these, these fantastical people. And, and I see the harm that has been done and the enduring quality of that harm. What would I do? Would I forego my libertarian instincts? No, not at all. In fact, I would embrace my libertarian instincts even more enthusiastically than I already do. But I would also say that there is a certain hopelessness about the situation. Uh, it's not because, because I say that, that, that Argentine is beyond the pale. Maybe it's not. I hope it isn't. But for the time being, you say to yourself, well, can, can a libertarian play by the rules of this game? What are the rules of the game? How, how, does, how, how do the rules of the game pan out in reality? And, and so it's true that the libertarian is, is an idealist. And, and I regard myself as an idealist in that sense. And in the South African context, I say quite proudly, I don't vote. I don't vote because I think the vote is a fraud. And I don't want to participate in that fraud. That's, that's a personal thing, it's ideological. But it, it, it emerges from the fact that, that I do not believe that, that anything good is going to come out of the political process in South Africa. Now, Big Daddy Liberty, you know, was a very inspired spark talk this morning, and, and I agree with him. I, I only hope that, that Big Daddy is going to go out and choose one issue that, that, that could attract not a million people, but 10 million people, and that's unemployment. Mm -hmm. We know that from, from, the, from, from, from the surveys that have been done by the Institute of Rassman, <coughs> that unemployment is by far the, the, the most important issue. Now, if, if <coughs> matters of that were kind of were started to be addressed, and were addressed in a constructive fashion, and one could see the result, one could see Big Daddy being attracting his, his, his million person follower, then, then one, one would have regained some confidence in himself. But for the time being, I have no confidence at all. And uh, so, is it a cop-out? Well, yes, I suppose it is. But it, it doesn't diminish me in my commitment to, to libertarianism. And on the other hand, I do not feel <coughs> that a libertarian is in any way being self-contradictory by saying, well, the situation doesn't work. I see it doesn't work. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for like-minded individuals. And so therefore, I do not participate. And I think what, what uh, Rex is doing in history is to open up the structures of history. And those are the very structures that I'm suggesting, without being certain about it, are the consideration of which are, are foreclosed uh, by the liber libertarian ideology. Let me, let me give you a con concrete example. Laurie Akiman, who was a very good judge and a very good judge on the Constitutional Court, wrote a book in which he tried to justify on other grounds the notion that reparations must be made, uh, that uh, reparations must be made to black people. And he did it on this basis, that we are, as white people, the recipients of... Uh, of apartheid-based based largesse. Um, we have been enriched by that process. We may have done, been enriched involuntarily, and that's the important point. We may have been enriched involuntarily, but nonetheless, the fact of the enrichment 
as it does at common law, uh, so within social policy, produces the consequence uh, that we must be coerced into disgorging, as white people, disgorging more than we might otherwise be expected to. That's Laurie's uh, proposition. So he places a redistribution on the basis of enrichment. And what he does is therefore to capture the past. You capture the past, and you talk about the negative elements about it. He captures the past, talks about the negative elements, and talks about a way in which one can think about reconstructing society so that those negative ele elements are purged. I, when I read the libertarian um, philosophies, and obviously we're engaged here on something that is um, a process of characterization, of categorization. And the categories are, are potentially porous in the way that Leon has indicated. And we can reconstruct so that ultimately um, race-based uh, apartheid became separate development and we had plurals instead of blacks and all this kind of thing, I don't know. We can reconstruct language in order to produce results. I take libertari libertarian principles sufficiently seriously in order to try and understand the ahistorical and asocial nature of it and the rejection of utilitarianism as an appropriate way to proceed. You are saying that the historical um, uh, map provides context uh, so that your ideology um, um, ultimately may, may, produce, may produce certain consequences. And your refusal to vote, I don't think, is a consequence of libertarianism. I think it's a consequence of your frustration with the impotence, the, well, the, the uh, imperfectibility of current, uh, uh, current, current um, government and current solutions. I also think that it's a form of the public. Yeah. Well, ultimately, uh, it depends who the public is, I suppose, but well, I'm not sure. Can I just ask yeah. yeah, you know, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, Just a, a response to what you said about uh, Laurie Ackerman and that proposition. I, I'm not sure that I see a genuinely libertarian um, uh, opposition to that proposition when he said, you know, if there, if there was, in fact, injustice that caused the enrichment of one group of people at the expense of another, I don't see a libertarian reason to deny uh, the address. The reason to deny that is probably a lot more pragmatic, you know, which goes to, well, firstly, how do you, how do you determine quantum? Yeah. How do you determine the exact individuals that ought to be recompensed? And, and how do you do that practically? How far do you go back in history? <coughs> you know, I mean, my country was occupied by the Spanish for 100 years. You know, I'm still traumatized by that. Do I now get to claim from from Spain some sort of reparation for all the trauma that my forefathers uh, suffered? Um, so there's really a practical or pragmatic opposition to the idea of, of um, compensation and redress, rather than the principled one. I think. I think it's very important that we should understand what we're doing. What what is wrong? It seems to me to do is to say I'm a libertarian, uh, therefore I have these values. I think what one should say is, I have these values, therefore I fall within the niche that is characterized as libertarianism. Your values are not, I would suggest, properly characterized as libertarian if the conventional orthodox um, conception of libertarianism, which is people should be left to be as they are, subject to the non-aggression principle, uh, is properly applied. Because I, don't, I, don't, I struggle to place your ideology within that framework. Yes. No, well, there you are. Then what you do is backtrack from the ideology, which is considered a political ideology as well as a moral one. In other words, that's how we could best regulate society. Colin? I'd like to ask a question which we can park for later, arising from what Rick said. Very simply, why should we worry about the unemployed? Well, the ANC doesn't. Oh, no. But, <laughs> <laughs> but why, should, why, why don't the unemployed worry about it? See no sign that the unemployed worry about yet. Well, they have no incentive to do so. No, some very little incentive to do so because the whole point, the whole reason why unemployment is not the problem that everybody yes. makes it well, so, that's is because of social welfare. The social well, welfare there, net. There are, other, there are other things. I think for a ten-minute slot, it could be quite an interesting thing if someone wants to, because it's such a gut reaction that we should worry about the unemployed, and I'm just suggesting why. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm not heartless. I'm not saying yeah. we shouldn't worry about human suffering. We should. But the, once you pose that question, you in, 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 
immediately imposing obligations on other people to solve the problem of the unemployed and suggesting that it's a government problem to solve the problem. Yeah. And a whole lot of raft of art things. And then you move away from libertarianism profoundly. Sorry? You move away from libertarianism profoundly and into conceptions of... Well, I think it is a libertarian position to say it's not my... It's, it's no, no, it's, it's yours is, but the corollary is yes, not. Yeah. Anyway, it's, I'd yeah. like to suggest that as a, as a possible discussion. Yeah. 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 I, I'd just like to interject for a moment in response to a comment that just was said. Uh, why should we worry about the unemployed? Well, it's, it's, I think it's, it's the most burning question that, that this country has to face, and potentially could give rise to, to the collapse of the entire social structure. So but those, those are practical considerations. But there, there are other reasons why uh, one should worry about it. And Colin is quite wrong when he says it's not the government's problem. Uh, it is the government's problem because the government has created the problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the very, that's the very <laughs> issue. And, and yeah. were, it, were it not for issues like uh, the minimum wage, for instance, and, and the various forms of, of, of labor legislation with which you are very familiar, uh, were it not for that, or for more, some, some of the more pernicious uh, programs involved in, those, in that legislation, we would not be sitting with the kind of unemployment yeah. un un that we have in I, I agree with that. Too. <coughs> Sorry, it's not the, it, it's okay, I'll um, just to uh, address your uh, um, statement, basically, libertarians aren't utilitarian. Um, von Mises, I don't know if you count him as a libertarian, but he was quite explicitly a utilitarian job. Uh, he was quite upfront about it. Yeah. And also surveys of people who claim to be libertarian, you know, self confessed libertarians, uh, when you asked about their preferred ethical philosophy, you know, virtue ethics, yes, into yes. Your consequentialism, or your, um, what's the other one? Yeah. Deontology, yes. Uh, quite a large fraction of them pick some sort of uh, consequentialism. So you're really with Leon. Leon says it's a matter of degree, and you move from the one to the other, and, the, the, and it's, these, these are positions on a continuum, and libertarian is, is just just favors, I think I'm putting these words into your mouth, libertarianism favors liberty more, uh, but nonetheless has ample scope uh, for consideration of utilitarian principles. Yeah, Not as I read the literature. There's principle. some fuzziness in the term too. I mean, recently we argued about what left and right mean. Yeah, well, and I think, yeah. you know, they, they're uh, fairly incoherent uh, categories quite often. And uh, liberalism itself has also become yes. more and more diverse in what it means. So, uh, I think it's very difficult. To That's why it's important to debate the substance rather than the nomenclature, it seems to me. So, that's what somebody from front said you want to come. No, Mark, I just want to make the point, follow, following from what Rex said, that it is the invasion of the freedom very often by the state, uh, notably freedom of contract, that has caused unemployment and part of it. Oh. So, that, that must be sure that the libertarian you. position must say, we arrange that. That should be our problem. That's entirely constant. Constant. Yeah. Can, can I ask you to define uh, utilitarianism? Uh, because yes, the, of course. The, the original idea, probably of John Stuart Mill, of greatest good for the greatest number, isn't necessarily what everybody is thinking about with utilitarianism. It may just be because it works rather than. Yes. The, this sort of majoritarian idea of utilitarianism. I think we set up a dichotomy between uh, a principled approach to life on the one hand and a consequentialist approach. I think I tried to convey that. A consequentialist approach asks always in relation to a policy, what will the consequences be? And a utilitarian uh, in different shades and with all sorts of uh, permutations, intensity and problems like that. But a utilitarian weighs up the weighs up the consequences, good or bad, in a calculus and produces a result that preponderates in favor of the policy or against the policy. That's, and I don't want to become more specific than that. I use it only in that sense. Sorry, was there something else? Uh, no, I was just going to say, um, I don't know how much I enjoyed listening to you. Thank you, Francis. And to you. Rex, because it was, uh, you know, we get used to hearing the same old thing over and over here, and not going back to basic principles. 
And in a way, it encapsulated for me what the difficulty has been and what has maybe stopped me from regarding myself as a libertarian any longer. Because if you take that pure and principled position, you kind of get stuck. You find yourself like Richard, like, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you find yourself like Richard Yevsky. You move from the, the quintessential or the archetypal libertarian position and you move yourself move increasingly across the across the divide until you become a liberal orientated utilitarian. Exactly. The, the characterization is not important. What is vital <coughs> is to understand, I think, the methodologies of reasoning. What are we doing? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to think about? What sorry, you know? No, no, I just want to say one of the problems of being a libertarian is you can't discipline a you know, an insubordinate wife, but uh, <laughs> that's another matter. Uh, just to just want to point out that uh, libertarians like uh, Richard Epstein and Gordon Tullock and others uh, are in fact libertarians, and I'll tell you why I say that. Uh, I happen to be personally friendly with Richard Epstein and was with Gordon Tullock, who's since died. But uh, when you walk around New York or Chicago, both, both of which universities he lectures, uh, with Richard Epstein looking for somewhere to dine or have coffee or whatever, he will make all the necessary en passant comments that a libertarian makes, as you would make, and you would see somebody being, you know, rights being violated by the cops being chased away, being a street vendor, or someone in Central Park being told they're not allowed to sit here, they must sit there, or whatever it might be, or you would comment on regulations that govern you know, apartment owners where he's renting an apartment or whatever. And the comment is always, this is a violation of somebody's freedom. He doesn't say, but for this measure there would be a greater, <laughs> for a greater number. Yes, you see. So, and, and you are like that too. So what I'm saying is in the, in the utilitarian liberal lurks a libertarian. Yeah for whom the principle matters. And Gordon Tullock was much stronger about this than Richard Epstein. He absolutely insisted as a Chicago school, Milton Friedman type uh, person, uh, that it's all about calculus. You just got to work it out, which is the better benefit, and you, you just it's all empirical, and it's all econometric, and so on. But he would have the same impulse. He would, he would speak in common day chat, as you do, about what's wrong with people's rights being violated. Yeah without going into a long diatribe about what would the calculus tell me about this. And, uh, and Milton Friedman, by the way, did call himself a libertarian. I was also privileged to know him and have dined with him and so on. Uh, he, he was of the view that if he said so publicly, it would reduce the degree to which he could influence uh, uh, thought. Uh, whether he would have continued to say that after Ron Paul made libertarianism a legitimate word and a popular word, I don't know. I think Milton Friedman might then have come out of the closet. Would he have been able to discipline his wife? Uh, yeah, well, the, the two of them, there's a little anecdotal story about them, were both very diminutive. They were absolutely tiny. And uh, there was the joke in Chicago that people would often see a car going down the road without a driver. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you looked closely and carefully enough, there was Milton Friedman sort of peeping over the dashboard, and his wife was simply sitting down and couldn't see anything that was happening. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I don't know, well, why is that relevant? I can't remember, but it's not. So. <laughs> but, but he was, um, uh, he was, uh, uh, definitely a libertarian and he would have said so and he attended many libertarian conferences and spoke there and was happy to be regarded as one of them but like me he didn't think going out there and spewing the word was productive. My absolute last response. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But can I tell you something sad about libertarianism? Yeah. You know, I mean, why, why shouldn't, and I'm not, I think to say I'm asking him to spew the word and I'm not asking the young to do anything he doesn't want to do, I admire what he does. It just strikes me as being, therefore, some kind of incomprehensible reflection on what we call ourselves <coughs> materials, that we don't, that we feel <coughs> for a tactical reason for not using the word, and exactly why I've regarded it as a purely internal uh, value. But 
I hear what Dion says and I thank him for the explanation. Well, well what's startling to me is that we've had this wonderful debate for me, wonderful debate, and not a word has been said about the parting reposts of my paper as to how libertarianism is designed to prop up uh, the status of the rich. Yes. Nobody has said a word about that. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.